So, we're very fortunate tonight to have one of our own, a local, come back to us. Uh, someone who has made good, and we are very proud of Dr. Myra Jackson. It is a great pleasure for me to read a brief introduction before we hear his talk. Dr. Myron M. Jackson, our speaker for the annual Institute lecture. He is the current holder of the Bessel Family Chair in Ethics, Religion, and Society at Xavier University in Cincinnati, Ohio. Now, before occupying this, it's a new chair, right? It's uh, um, been fifth. created recently, fifth. and you're the first occupant. No, it's oh, fifth. You're the fifth occupant, so this is an established going mm -hmm. answer. So before starting at Xavier University in this position this year, uh, you were previously at Grand Valley State University in Michigan for several years, but he does have deep local connections, as I mentioned. He received his uh, a bachelor's degree and then a doctorate in philosophy here at Southern Illinois University at Carbondale. And um, rumors abound is how this feat was uh, accomplished, but you, you did very well, of course. You wrote a dissertation. The title of his dissertation was Ironic American Exceptionalism and the Myth of the Open Self. And of course, he has published a great deal since those times as an accomplished philosopher. He continues to have very broad academic and political interests beyond just American thought, although he has published his essays and articles on many figures in American philosophical history, but he's also published on current topics in social and political philosophy, on issues in philosophy and religion, philosophy of culture, of course, public law, the history of political thought, and philosophy and race. As uh, Randy mentioned, Dr. Jackson has been a fellow of this institute probably practically from the beginning, wouldn't you say, Randy? Yeah. Uh, one of our first fellows. Yeah. And uh, here he is coming back to us in this important capacity. The title of his talk tonight is The Athletic Renaissance, Atlas, Gaia, and Hercules. Please help me welcome Dr. Myra Jackson. Thank you. Good evening to you, and it's great to see everyone, old friends, and I'll be back into our old stomping grounds. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay. Um, so I'm honored to be here, and uh, it, I have been involved since the beginning, and uh, it's amazing to see how things develop and grow, uh, especially it's good to see when people come together, I think, and uh, do these kinds of constructive, uh, what I refer to as like a philosophical consulate. Uh, kind of embassy of uh, keeping philosophy, especially American philosophy, uh, relevant and active. So um, the title of my talk is um, The Athletic Renaissance, Atlas, Gaia, and Hercules. And I want to look at this um, trinity in a, uh, uh, from these uh, Hellenistic figures um, a as a kind of symbolization um, for this athletic renaissance that I think has hyper-erotic as well as hyper-tragic elements. And so I want to emphasize um, the first part will be more focused on the, um, the positive side, what I call the hyper-erotic, the possibilities that are inherent uh, within this kind of uh, energy explosion. Um, whereas there's also this kind, uh, this, this high cost to what you get from uh, the advantages of these possibilities. So I want to present some ideas related to how we could think about the ethics of energy and how this relates to sustainability efforts with regards to um, the environment. Uh, I just want to first say before I get into my talk that I've had the pleasure to research um, working with the Institute. As John said, I've um, been involved in other projects, but I specifically have had the chance to work on this for the Institute, uh, and I really like the eclectic ability for all of us to work on different projects, so I think it makes a richer um, contribution. So Bruno Latour, uh, a French pragmatic thinker, uh, a philosopher and sociologist, um, has said, ecologize or modernize. That is the kind of threshold that we are currently in. Um, because the idea is that modernity has brought about this kind of unleashing of so many powers uh, and accelerated so many forces uh, that um, 
we we have reached the 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 threshold of whether or not this is sustainable and so this this ultimatum facing our current epoch has brought not only great progress with it but also great uncertainty uh, great threats our age wears uh, one of the different masks uh, that post-enlightenment and post-Christian modern forms of subjectivity have developed. And what I want to argue is that the athlete is the prototype, the ideal figure that I think symbolizes um, what is required for us to maintain and live uh, under these kinds of accelerated enhanced conditions. Uh, the West has undergone many transitions uh, that I don't have time to discuss in order to get to this athlete. Uh, but maybe you can bring it up during um, the Q&A. So I wanna start with the story of, cause I think this captures what Latour is talking about, Hercules encountering Atlas who is carrying the world on, their on his shoulders. And Hercules, for some reason, there's always golden apples uh, or forbidden fruit in these stories. And so he comes with some golden apples and uh, he, um, uh, wants to uh, have Atlas carry these, uh, hold these apples for him uh, while um, he uh, needs to um, develop a cunning, a kind of uh, strategy, a kind of uh, undercutting, if you will, of how to trick Atlas into uh, not only carrying the weight of the world, uh, but uh, being able to exchange the weight of the world and to be able to give it back. So this is a powerful story to me that within the Anthropocene literature, and let me just say, uh, the Anthropocene is something that I will continue to talk about. It's just related to the ecological crisis. It's related to climate change, uh, and many people have studied it from uh, different um, aspects. But this symbolization of carrying the weight on our shoulders, carrying the weight of the world on our shoulders, to me represents um, what Hercules and the athlete symbolize. And what I mean by that is that human beings uh, within the last century have been seen uh, anthropologically, um, culturally, as being the divas of nature, uh, very high maintenance. Um, this, you, can, you can associate this with capitalism, but I think it goes beyond capitalism, and I think it goes beyond materialism. It relates to the idea that we seek to um, be pampered, be comforted, uh, to enhance our ways of life and prove our ways of life. And we do this in a way that emphasizes what you can say is um, a grooming uh, kind of self-care, self-intensification. Uh, and so, from this standpoint, I, I refer to this as a metaphysics of endurance. A metaphysics of endurance represents a deburdening, a disinhibiting, and a kind of pampering and comforting that is associated with the human being uh, becoming more feminine as opposed to masculine. I will talk about this. Hercules is associated with being a masculine figure where I believe this kind of grooming, this kind of metaphysics of endurance relates to more of a feminine uh, sense of the athlete. Um, so in accepting this, 20th century philosophers have argued that human beings seek to exploit exponential energy sources in order to increase our ways of life, improve our ways of life. Uh, within the literature, this has been referred to as anti-gravity. Anti-gravity is the idea that civilizations, especially advanced civilizations, want to go higher, they want to go faster, they want to go further. As I just heard today that we just, another vehicle landed on Mars and is ready to look at Mars quakes, earthquakes on Mars. Uh, so this is the kind of example of anti-gravity that you can think of a trillion other examples that we seek to break the Guinness Book of World Records. We seek to go beyond whatever the set standard is. And we not only reward this, but we become disloyal to our past rituals. We become uprooted in a way that makes us not be so uh, loyal or committed to what came previously. 
So disloyalty and uprootedness goes along with being these kinds of divas of nature and being high maintenance the high maintenance species or the high maintenance animal. Uh, by the way, if you look at the scientific literature, you will see that a field is related to this called neoteny. Neoteny is explaining the human being based on juvenile features, which are more feminine features rather than masculine features within the animal world. So uh, without getting into the nuances of evolution, there's a sense in which the human being represents this uh, softening, uh, deburdening of um, the rough and the tough uh, of nature, uh, the, uh, the tooth and claws of nature. Um, so we seek to embrace a kind of luxury which has um, encouraged not only whimsical enterprises, but even uh, there's been a critique uh, set out against this by people who I'm going to argue um, do not recognize the benefits of uh, this kind of metaphysics of endurance uh, because they associate it with joblessness and boredom. Uh, because if you think about it, if you're engaged in anti-gravity projects, people will immediately think or assume that you are either playing non-serious or you are just whimsical and frivolous. Um, and in that sense, we have embraced impatience and instant gratification. And this is our way of not necessarily enjoying the principle uh, of abundance and affluence, but it makes us want to never be satisfied. This is called a kind of smug dissatisfaction um, related to uh, this anti-gravity of going higher, faster, and further. So modernity is about recognizing the limits of resemblance. Since things do not resemble um, what came before, and you can think of this, uh, I'm sure many of you can think uh, of how if you walk into a room today, especially the classroom, it looks like a sci-fi classroom. It looks like um, something that was only imaginary and in Hollywood. Uh, and so that kind of imaginative free play has made it possible for us to think about how the foreign and the non-able can drive the familiar and drive the able. Uh, and so this has opened us up to so many possibilities that I think there's a lot of positive things out of it. For example, we have developed climate politics. We have developed atmospheric politics, which um, before the 20th century really um, wasn't off the ground yet. So we have recognized implicit powers uh, through being able to um, go deeper, uh, go, fa go faster, go further, uh, go higher, uh, all of these traits that uh, we associate with anti-gravity. Um, the cost of this, of course, uh, does relate to uh, an extreme amount of waste and also uh, what um, one of my favorite philosophers, uh, Peter Slaughter, I call spam ontologies. Spam ontologies are when you have to account for massive production uh, on a distributive level. And this kind of distribution, nobody really owns. There are no clear boundaries, uh, or at least no one is willing to take ownership of it. Nobody is willing to take responsibility for it. And this creates a kind of chaos. This creates a kind of massive decentralization where we struggle to find representatives, people who are willing to not only be our leaders, but they're willing to take responsibility and be accountable. And uh, so this is a very famous issue called uh, no skin in the game. Uh, nobody is really willing to take uh, any skin in the game because these are uh, decentralized processes as well as, and this leads me to uh, a main theme that I want to emphasize uh, on the positive side, um, it is associated with um, maximum optimization. And that's a fancy word for recognizing how um, you, uh, if you are going to be a successful business today or you're going to be a successful organization today, you've actually got to be way out ahead. You've actually got to um, have this kind of metaphysical endurance that accounts for 
self-perpetuating processes that accounts for accelerated processes that uh, move at hyper speeds, at hyper distances, and this requires a kind of hypercognition. That's my fancy word uh, that I have come up with. This isn't in the literature related to how uh, we have to not only keep up with these processes, but we are actually thinking at meta levels. And this is where the athletic renaissance comes in because the athlete teaches us to not only have versatility and agility, but we have to be willing to be cunning. We have to be willing to uh, recognize how others will be cunning toward us. And I think in the world of social media, this is very evident. Uh, we always are second guessing everything we see as we should be. We're operating at a kind of hyper meta level of cognition. We constantly think that whatever you post, it wasn't necessarily sincere or it was more of a performative self and I've got to scratch the surface. I've got to go deeper to find out what's really going on. So this kind of, uh, you can also associate it with the phenomenon of fake news. Uh, these kinds of issues, this, these kinds of issues relate to hypercognition and this constant cunning that is extremely draining on people uh, and it causes a kind of, the, 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 the downside or the, the side effects of this is a kind of uh, um, uh, resignation. Uh, one checks out or one gives up uh, because it, it, it requires a lot in order to keep up with it. It requires a kind of endurance related to the theme of this metaphysical endurance. So, um, this, this is referred to as a design principle uh, that never settles on any kind of resemblance. It seeks to always move forward. It seeks to, uh, in a certain sense, let the work do its thing and set it free. And, um, uh, Slaughterdyke in his uh, work, the reason why I'm quoting Slaughterdyke is because um, I didn't say that at the beginning. Bruno Latour uh, is not only um, a, a, a serious uh, scholar with uh, Slaughterdyke, but he refers to himself as a Slaughterdykean. Uh, and he's the one who's done all this incredible work on uh, climate change and the issue facing Gaia and uh, facing um, the ecological crisis and the Anthropocene. So Slaughterdyke refers to this as this design principle as the anti prayer. We live in an age of the anti-prayer in the sense that we are never willing to stop and give thanks because we must, again, emphasizing this endurance, focus on an uprootedness or uh, this kind of um, disloyalty where we are always looking for constant updates and installments. This is maximum optimization. You're trying to get the most um, out of your accessories and out of your programs. And this is very annoying if you have a cell phone or if you are familiar with any of the technology going on out here, uh, you're constantly behind and you feel behind and you're, you feel the weight of the world uh, in being behind. And this causes a great amount of anxiety. This causes a lot of tension in the sense that um, you never uh, know if you're getting beyond the hype and the hype is, of course, uh, what we all have to work our way through in order to get so to something that's very meaningful. Uh, because when you're not holding on to any of these rituals, when you're not holding on to resemblances, things that resemble the past, then it is really the hype that gets you to break the security, to break the comfort zone. Because our past rituals, they kind of ground us. They give us a sense of comfort. They give us a sense of security. They give us a sense of belonging. And so if you don't have these things because of a metaphysics of endurance that emphasizes being uprooted and being disloyal and always going for what is the interesting or what is the novel, what is the new thing, then you find yourself always being sold hype, always being sold sensationalism, uh, the shiny thing, because otherwise you don't have anything to ground it in. It is, it is a kind of... Uh, unrepeatable ritual or it's seen as a groundless ritual uh, that doesn't uh, give you a sense of belonging or it doesn't give you a sense of security. We all feel vulnerable amongst this ocean of possibilities that you get with maximum optimization and um, with always having to be out ahead. Um, if you think about all of the products that we buy from catalogs, 
uh, to accessories, you see that there, what we're being shown is actually always behind. It is actually always lagging. Uh, and uh, the people who are programming it, the people who are designing it, are already two, three, four years ahead. Similar to the way this institute functions, just like any other organization or institute, uh, under if they want to be successful, if they want to sustain themselves, uh, they'll have to keep up with this kind of hypercognition. They'll have to keep up with this kind of endurance. So, uh, with things moving at these uh, uh, hyperspeeds uh, and hyper distances requiring hypercognition, there's a kind of cunning uh, that we have to recognize that the history, and this is where I'm going to get philosophical here for a minute, the history of philosophy, especially in uh, the notion of practical reason and phronesis, uh, failed to really deal with this uh, cunning. It was um, Hegel, the German idealist, uh, Schopenhauer, uh, his book, um, uh, The Art of Being Right, that starts to take cunning seriously because cunning, uh, the cunning of reason uh, was seen as kind of detrimental. It was seen as parasitic. Uh, and so it wasn't seen as fundamental, uh, but with this kind of acceptance of hypercognition and this design principle of anti-prayer, you get worked in reason, a kind of violent measurement that accepts cunning as the underbelly of logos. It accepts cunning as the trickster, uh, the disguise, um, the game plan, so to speak, in the athletic parlance of what's really going on behind the scenes or behind the formations. So that cunning, that kind of uh, um, trickster uh, strategizing is not only what you find in design, but it is also what I think you find in the figure of Hercules. Hercules uh, at first falls in love with his tricks. If you look at the Hercules 12 labors, and there's a debate about whether there's 12, some people say there's 11, some people say there's 13. Uh, but the point is, is Hercules starts out falling in love with these tricks and he becomes enamored with them. Uh, the famous story that I wanna uh, quickly go over is um, the um, Augean stables that he is supposed to clean out. Uh, that he makes a bet, uh, I believe it's the fifth labor, uh, that he's going to clean out uh, within a day. And uh, he's able, of course, to do this through great cunning. Uh, he, uh, he agrees to uh, uh, meet, meet the uh, goal and the feat, but he does not want to tell uh, the king how he is doing this. And so he diverts the rivers. And in diverting the rivers, he's showing you this kind of cunning uh, he's showing you a kind of hypercognition, and he's also showing you what I think is relevant for the ecological crisis or the Anthropocene, which is that modernization and the limits of resemblance is about this cunning that tricks nature. And so I don't see much of a difference between Hercules tricking the flows of the river in the story of the Aegean stables uh, than a geneticist who is tricking the genes in the lab uh, to do one thing, whereas they would normally do another. And we find great cures, we find great possibilities, we find maximal optimization in this hypercognition. So you would actually not want to just write this off and not just give this a completely tragic interpretation. You would want to appreciate the ability, the possibilities within it, and you would not want to um, become uh, completely cynical or pessimistic. Of course, Heracles, Hercules, learns an important lesson in this. He ends up getting sued by the king. This sounds like a modern corporation. <laughs> he gets sued by the king and uh, he ends up having to go back and not only pay for this, uh, this labor by uh, not really keeping his side of the bet, his uh, cunning was uh, revealed to him, uh, but also he didn't really have a fair deal. He didn't, that's a very symbolic notion to me in terms of how we think about intellectual property rights and uh, co uh, copyright law uh, and um, the future of data as opposed to the law being around things and property and objects, persons, places, and things. When you go into the information age of data, the law institutions have to reconsider how you will deal um, with uh, these kinds of agreements uh, and um, these kinds of uh, parameters. 
So Heracles ends up uh, getting um, sued. He goes into court, uh, and through this litigation, he ends up having to uh, save himself. Uh, uh, he ends up having to serve another year of, of work, and he costs himself another labor because this labor is not seen as counting. Uh, because uh, it wasn't a real labor in the sense of this cunning. So one of the things that I want to ask um, is how far are we willing to go? Clearly, there's a sense of you have to uh, ask yourself how far are you willing to cheat? Or are you even willing to call this cheating? Uh, it seems from the moral of the story that uh, Heracles was cheating and he has to learn his lesson. But something that we have to ask ourselves is, is this cheating when we discover a cure to AIDS or to cancer by using this kind of trickery, this kind of cunning in hypercognition? So these ethical issues, I believe, are new on the table. And I believe that we're starting to think through them in the sense of you have to start reconsidering uh, how we look at not only um, these processes, but also our uh, how does our ethics and our loyalties uh, change? How is it adjusted under these different conditions, which seem to be um, more extreme? So because of this, uh, there's a kind of smug dissatisfaction. There's a kind of smug dissatisfaction uh, related to um, our psychosocial. Did this go out? <laughs> so uh, there's a kind of... Um, smug dissatisfaction that goes along with this attitude of design as anti-prayer uh, because you're never really satisfied and uh, you um, don't stop to give grace or thanks because to stop and give grace uh, in this old sense is um, seen as a, a vulnerability. It's seen as um, uh, why would you do it? Uh, you're encouraged to move on or at least you're encouraged to um, embrace uh, anti-gravity and embrace uh, the things that high culture wants to uh, privilege, which is to always leave the previous behind. It's always to surpass what has come before as a metaphysics of endurance. And again, the athlete is the kind of prototype, the paradigm that represents uh, this, this desire to move on uh, and to um, continue in this mode of always trying to outdo yourself. And that leads me to the second part that I want to emphasize, which is in the cunning of hypercognition, the underbelly of logos, as the grooming animal, human beings are constantly outwitting ourselves. We are constantly undercutting ourselves. Again, this has a hypererotic side. Um, medical industry, the medical industry and modernity, for example, has major breakthroughs, not only by technologies that can go deeper, uh, can get on the interiors of things. This is a kind of anti-gravity, x-ray machines, ultrasounds, body scans. But there's also the athletes in the ancient world who were willing to get cut on by strangers. It's a major development within culture for us to be willing to get cut on by strangers. And it really is an, uh, uh, an amazing vulnerability that took a long time to develop. But the athletes were some of the first models of people who were willing to do this through uh, Galen, for example. You can read uh, about the gladiators that he uh, was uh, the physician for uh, and all of the things that they went through in terms of working out the wounds and the cuts. Um, but b based off of that, there's a development of uh, undercutting and outwitting that leads to development and it leads to going beyond what came before. We do this every day in the sense of trying to be out better ourselves, trying to outdo ourselves. We have to undercut ourselves just like an athlete. I must train and practice and go into intense discipline in order to get better. As a bodybuilder, I have to build myself down, tear myself down in order to build myself back up at a higher level, at a more intense level. So this undercutting and outwitting myself is a part of this cunning, which is this underbelly of logos. And it goes along with this kind of hypercognition. On the flip side, the tragic side, what is believable under these conditions 
Is there anything now such as institutional trust or social trust? These are issues that are clearly now on the table if you embrace this kind of undercutting and outwitting of oneself as a way to develop, as a way to progress. So the hyper tragic side to me comes out in the story of Heracles in Euripides. So I have talked about the story of the 12 labors of Heracles, but in Euripides you get a different Heracles, you get a different Hercules. I keep saying Heracles and Hercules, they're, they're used interchangeably if you don't know. Um, that's the, the Heracles is the Roman, um, or Hercules is the uh, Roman uh, version of Heracles. So in Euripides is Heracles, Heracles discovers that he has murdered his wife and his children. He has been overcome by madness. The question is, in the hypertragic sense, has this ex hypercognition, has this um, metaphysics of endurance, will it make us all mad? Will it make us all crazy? Essentially, will these anti-gravity projects, uh, levitation projects of going faster, further, and higher, uh, will this make us mad and crazy such that we wake up and we have discovered that we have killed our contemporaries and our children, future generations. To me, this was a powerful metaphor that I haven't found in the literature on how to think about the Anthropocene and the ecological crisis. Because here's this great athlete who now has to take himself seriously in the sense of asking himself, what is the morality of my cunning? What is, how far am I willing to go? And so Heracles, the great hero, becomes a kind of Goliath unto himself, a complete stranger in his own land, a villain who is overcome with madness and he contaminates himself, leading to the curses by the gods because he believes his unfathomable deeds are proof enough that they have rejected him. These deeds he believes he must go around and he must undo by finding ways of purifying his pollution and to use a kind of uh, Christian um, terminology, to find repentance and atonement. One must find ways to reconcile with one's, terrible, with one's horrible vengeance on the earth, on Gaia. And so this brought me back to not only learning this lesson with Heracles and looking at him not only as a great hero who's great at cunning and the underbelly of Logos in a hyper-erotic sense, but also in this hyper-tragic sense, coming to the realization of his own deeds and the fact of how polluted they are, that he can't even fathom what he has done nor can his stepfather. And this overwhelming um, kind of uh, condition uh, leads me to think about two things, and I will close. One, Plato's Republic, if you recall his doctrine of the noble lie, which I, many people, I believe, uh, have seen the noble lie as a sense of cunning that you get in Plato. Uh, but uh, it is not the cunning that most people would associate with just making sure that you defeat your opponent or making sure that you outdo your competition. If there's a kind of moral attachment and quality associated with Plato's noble lies. He thinks it's good for you, it's good food, it's good medicine. Um, but there was one of the noble lies that we all come from Gaia, that we all come from the same place, that we all come from Earth. Uh, and I was wanting us to at least think and consider about how true that is today for us and whether or not we need to confront this in terms of the ecological crisis. It seems like we're all citizens of the earth and it may be that all of the citizens of the earth are not, are not just human, but there's also non-human citizens of the earth. And this is something that may has, maybe has been neglected in a hyper-tragic sense. And so that's very important for me to think about and I think that Plato was onto something in emphasizing Gaia as uh, the kind of uh, the basis from which we all kind of spring as a kind of rootedness that we can all agree to and fight for, or at least um, find solidarity in. The second thing that I want to say, or the last thing, is that um, it's also important to remember that Academicus, what Plato's first school was named after, was a kind of athletic god. There's a connection, I believe, between philosophy and the philosopher and the athlete. Uh, I think there's a connection between the academy and the gymnasium. They go together. 
Uh, and I think Plato, along with Hercules, shows us that the athlete and the philosopher can conjoin to contribute to the kinds of competitions that give rise to robust and intense cultural legacies. But we just don't do so blindly. We must do so in a way that keeps us fit, that keeps us well trained. And if you want to call this a kind of morality, you can, but I refer to it as a kind of an asceticism. Asceticism in the sense of how you are practicing, how you are exercising, how you are training yourself. There's a relationship between the trainer and the trainee in terms of this athlete uh, that we all are in ourselves, our, we're all our own marathon runners, if you will, and we have to see uh, if we're going to be fit or unfit, if we're going to be trained uh, or ill-trained uh, marathon uh, or runners or athletes. Coming to terms with the self that we are now and wanting to overcome that self is something that I think we all want to do in this hypercognition sense and in the sense of anti-gravity and improvement. But we have to be willing to ask ourselves how far will we go in order to cheat or will we even call this cheating? And how much of the crazy are we willing to accept? Because I think a, little, a lot of this is you could say crazy, <laughs> which is why I've used so many hypers or ubers uh, if you're talking in the German here tonight. So thank you very much. <laughs>
So we don't need to change our habits. What we need to do is modernize uh, these solar panels of wind so that we can continue to consume. Um, and how this kind of, really, if you thought about this. Really. Yes, I have. <laughs> um, so the first thing that I would like to say is that because we have not been loyal to the earth, we can think of all the tragedies and catastrophes related to this, but we can, if I were to emphasize the side that most people don't think about, which I, I think is we're becoming familiar with the earth again, as if it were the first time. Gaia uh, is uh, plentiful in a way that it shocks us, right? Uh, and historically, we kind of took these things for granted or overlooked these things because of our disloyalty and because of our uprootedness and emphasizing anti-gravity, levitation, hypercognition. Um, I think what has gone on is we have concealed the fact that we are burners before we are consumers. Uh, everybody is really a member of the burning team uh, before they consume. And civilization has done a good job of concealing or cunning, uh, disguising the fact that you've got to burn the energy and so an ethics of energy is very fundamental to a metaphysics of endurance because how you're not only the quality of energy but how you're using the energy the expediency of it is all on the table and so much of this has been stripped from our awareness it's as if you go to the restaurant and you don't even see who's making your food or you don't even know how many uh people have contributed to the cars in your uh i mean to the parts in your car uh, or even if they were people, they may have been robots. Uh, they say on average now we got 20 to 25 nations represented in every vehicle because of this kind of hypercognition where you're constantly networking all of these, uh, you know, um, meta levels of, uh, of uh, distributors and uh, producers. Um, so the final thing that I want to say about it, I can talk a lot, a lot about this. We can pick it up. I know we got to get to some more people, but I also want to emphasize there's a, a kind of... Um, doping and duping related to um, this uh, th th this notion of hypercognition. So the duping part, I think I've covered. It's another way of talking about the cunning, or at least you always, we always have the hysteria and the paranoia that we're getting duped, that we're getting played, or at least it's, it's, it, it haunts us. There's a hauntingness of, uh, of being duped. But then the doping uh, as well goes along with, are those going to be clean energies uh, or are they going to be seen as dirty energies? Are they going to be seen as um, respectable energies or regrettable energies down the line? These are clearly on the table in terms of the ethics of energy, in terms of how you're going to go about the doping and the duping, because I don't think you're going to eliminate the doping and the duping. The question is, how are you going to do it? And how much of, again, how far are you willing to go? Are you willing to call this cheating? And how much of the crazy <laughs> are you ready to embrace? And every athlete knows this. I mean, it look crazy. <laughs> People say, hey, you're obsessed. You cut off your phone. What's going on? Hey, I'm in training. <laughs> there's some crazy, there's some madness going on. So, uh, yes, please. Yeah, so um, I, I get the idea that cutting the constantly outdoing oneself and so yeah. on. But every athlete has to deal with uh, and trying to get through the other side, yeah. and, and, and to uh, and, and to deal with the uh, extending one's career for. Mm. Uh, and, 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 and I'm wondering. First of all, I mean, there are clearly athletes that shoot off and then boom, and then there are the ones that gracefully go on. Um, I'm just wondering whether the dealing gracefully yeah. extending one's career is a form of cunning itself, mm -hmm. and is that the kind of cunning that we might, uh, you know, if it is a kind of cunning, is that a kind of cunning that a uh, cunning that we might see us through to the end of the Anthropocene? Mm. Let me take the third part uh, real quick. Uh, yeah. So I. Think that the, the question actually was, can, can cunning yeah. see us through the Anthropocene? Mm. And then yeah. Um, I think it'll have to be included. Uh, the question again is, um, to what degree and what are you willing to set the parameters 
uh, for. But clearly we're out of just the old epistemology of this is the truth and this is the lie. And uh, the epistemology of the good news has been in a lot of ways replaced by the epistemology or the gospel of the bad news. Uh, so you have to embrace uh, cunning in some sense. Well, will it be the savior of the Anthropocene? It will have to, I believe, be used in that effort, but clearly there will be more that will be needed. If I could speak on the athlete real quick, athletes to me represent cultural icons and cultural icons, especially in America, speaking on our culture, uh, we have a culture of shame and blame. Uh, but before you get shamed and blamed, you usually are uh, a great hero. And so we go through very extreme, accelerated forms of being hyper erotic and then being hyper tragic. We, you, you have this great uh, 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 calling where you are the great athlete who uh, everybody loves you and then they're burning your jersey or at least they're saying, you know, uh, you're not with us. And so, or, or you know, you, get a, you go through a divorce or, you know, you uh, get a DUI or something like this. So you go from the hero to the villain. Uh, and then you have to wear the scarlet letter, so to speak. Uh, and based on that, I will say that it's hard to walk away for a lot of athletes, in your example, because so much of their identity is wrapped up in what they are, what they have been doing, their, probably their whole lives. And as a teacher, we are well aware that we try to find, again, versatility. This is a bad situation to put all your eggs in one basket. That's not the metaphysics of endurance. So metaphysics of endurance embraces versatility and large affordances of functionality. And so the more fit athletes are those who are willing to not only hang it up, but they have other things in mind and they're already set up on those other things. Whereas those who are um, the unfit athletes they tend to not only stick around that long, I mean, stick around too long, but they also uh, seem to not have anything to fall back on. And so they end up being the story, the tragic story, unfortunately, of they were very wealthy and they were a first round pick and then now they're broke. <laughs> they're bankrupt and they're going around giving talks about why you want to be careful and they become very cynical about the athletic industry in that sense. So you can go to one, you can go to the uh, either extreme. To me, that seems unfit. If you want to be a fit uh, and cultural interpreter, uh, an athlete, you want to find those kinds of balances related to uh, not getting too high and not getting too low. And uh, one other thing I want to say is that today you also have to be the kind of athlete that has a short memory. You have to have a, you have to be a kind of athlete that has a short memory. Shake off that bad play. <laughs> yes, sir. And this opens up my, the question that I was going to ask just from the beginning, which is the Colin Kaepernick question. Of oh. course. I mean, it has to be, so arguably, Colin Kaepernick has just had the best two and a half years of his professional career. Not um, playing. In the last two, right, yes. exactly. <laughs> uh, I want to You want to talk about cunning. Um, uh, here's a guy who has made himself more important as an athlete by not playing than he was as an athlete while playing. Um, because being one of the 24 or 25 people in the United States capable of being an NFL quarterback, not being one for a political reason, and one could argue a moral reason, is a way of going beyond. It's like, it's, it's like the cunning of Colin Kaepernick, to use your idea of cunning. The cunning is, hey, I don't actually have to play, and it's better if I don't, because then they, not only do they not hit me, and, and I can't fail. He can't fail doing what he's doing right now. But you've got companies like Nike that go, who's buying our shoes anyway? Yeah. Well, it's certainly not those people who are boycotting football right now. Mm -hmm. And so you bring, you bring Colin Kaepernick on as your, as your spokesman. He's a better athlete now than he ever has been. It on really, the yeah. other hand, half the question, Tim no Tebow, <laughs> Tim Tebow, on yeah. the other hand, so desperate to play quarterback, and yet even his hometown football team with nobody in the stadium won't hire this guy knowing that they could fill the stadium the next week with Christians 
who would come to support Tim Tebow. So you remember when Jacksonville was doing so badly. Had not, there's nobody in the whole stadium. The Jaguars, all, yeah. Uh, yeah, all they have to do is sign Tim Tebow to play four or five games. They sell out the stadium every week, and they wouldn't do it. Yeah. Now, you got two guys who are out of work here, right? One of them has the metaphysics of endurance. Mm -hmm. That's Kaepernick. The other one goes to play minor league baseball. Well, now he's on ESPN as an analyst, but yeah, he went to go play minor league baseball. Absolutely, yes, you're the very good examples. That's excellent. A lot of food for thought there. Uh, clearly, they're both polarizing figures, mm -hmm. and I think one is more relevant to the conversations of social justice, or at least the issues of social justice. So they register more in terms of the social consciousness, whereas the other seems polarizing in a way that's more traditional, like you said, in, uh, in terms of uh, praying. Uh, kneeling and praying. Well, what uh, if Tim Tebow took a knee during the national anthem? Everybody would think he was praying. Well, those memes are out there. Uh, <laughs> right. There's yeah, expo. Yeah. By the way, in the world of hypercognition, uh, all meanings become exponential. So good yeah. luck trying to settle on certain meanings because it's kind of a free for all. Uh, and so there's memes out there that uh, have used uh, Tim Tebow kneeling. Uh, within social media uh, uh, as an example of him being no different than Colin Kaepernick. So people have brought about that kind of equivalency. Uh, but I, I think you put your finger on very important figures that make us realize that the athletic renaissance is about how these are cultural icons and it goes way beyond sports in the literal sense. They become uh, either anchors for us or they become those that motivate us to um, resist what they stand for and what they're about. So this is why I see an intertwining with sports and politics and entertainment because it's more about the cultural icon that can embrace this kind of athletic attitude of being very fit, being very flexible. And I think Tim Tebow has done that in his own way. It hasn't related to social justice issues and uh, like Nike and other companies but he has turned himself into a TV analyst. He's turned himself into possibly a coach they're talking about. So um, having a broad, uh, uh, a diverse portfolio uh, is the way to go under these kinds of conditions. Because again, it goes back to um, uh, what Dave was talking about. Uh, you don't want to have your eggs in one basket, so to speak. Um, so you want to have these kinds of affordances. And Oh, well, Thank you. I'm almost reluctant to bring it up. I, maybe I'm the only person who saw it. I, I think this would either be an example of cunning or stupidity uh, when it comes to the environment. Did, did anybody besides me see the article um, online or somewhere recently that someone proposed um, basically um, jacking up the Antarctic ice shells as a way to prevent ocean level rise oh, that they were going to raise the Antarctic ice shells sounds like anti-gravity at work yeah <laughs> you know it just seems to me there could be some few and unanticipated consequences of that but that's excellent, Sam. Yes, there is. I didn't say that. Thank you. Uh, there is a thin line between cutting and stupidity. But, I will say that. You know, <laughs> but is that an example of, of an attempt at cunning? Not, 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 not. Attempt at cunning. It would be a very poor example, and here's why. Because it seems to be escapist. Uh, it really yeah. doesn't deal with uh, what you're essentially trying to do is exacerbate the problem by continuing to um, ignore yeah, yeah. how uh, you are relying upon Gaia and dependent in a way that um, is about not just humans as citizens, but non-humans as citizens as well. And there's a lot of not only resources and energy there, but life as well. Yeah. So, And you can see how it's all interconnected. To me, one of the major problems with anti-gravity has and this metaphysics of endurance and hypercognition has been it's associated with capitalism and a kind of individualism that's too much about independence the metaphysics of endurance is about interdependence it's about relationality rather than unilateral competition it's more about cooperation than it is about competition 
And this is why it's important to be on top of duping and doping and cunning because we want to actually get over the paranoia and the constant questioning of should I trust this? Should I recognize that I'm a part of this? Because I think we are. So we've, we've created these kinds of echo chambers and we've created comfort zones uh, that have made people very unhealthy and unfit in this metaphorical way because they only see their own independence. And of course, independence largely leads to loneliness and isolation and depression. It doesn't really create a kind of psychosocial moodiness that is about tackling that kind of problem, which is about coming together. Well, can I follow that up? Please. Uh, how do you think, with, with all of the, uh, of, uh, of, the, of the fake news and the talk about fake news uh, and, you know, the perceived and real bias in media and social media, etc. How do we get back to, to to trust? Because I'm sure I'm not alone in saying I don't know what to trust anywhere anymore, and I don't know where to go to find even something approximating truth when it comes to news or media or just almost anything. Great, Sam. Excellent. Uh, that's terrific. Uh, so one of the things I want to suggest is that we may have to reconsider the way we think about truth, the way we think about facts. Um, we may have to not look at facts as something that is uh, independent of us, back to that notion of independence, but it may be more that we're interrelated and interdependent. Uh, Latour actually argues that. That's why they call him the uh, post-truth philosopher. <laughs> I always like that name. <laughs> so, uh, but I'm afraid that I would probably come with some bad news if that's what you want because I interpret Nietzsche as saying when Nietzsche famously said God is dead I didn't take this as um, a complete affirmation of atheism I take it more as we live in an age without strong messengers or strong senders and so any message that you receive and let's say it's in your email box, right? And you trust that, I trust that, but not really. <laughs> because there's a sense in which every message I get, every phone call I get now, I'm going through this kind of hysteria of the metaphysics of endurance and I'm wrestling with it. I'm competing with it. And I'm in, in the world of representation, you are subject to this kind of uh, suspicion and this kind of uh, uh, paranoia. So everybody in a certain sense has become a conspiracy theorist, uh, whether you mean to or intend to or not, because of this hypercognition. And because we, are, again, are more interconnected. We're actually not as isolated as we think. We're actually more connected. And so we've been bad athletes on this point because the world is already virtually and digitally connected. We just need the political and the legal world to catch up. That's what we need. We're already connected. They're using a metaphysics of isolation and individualism that doesn't correspond with what we really, uh, the rituals that we've turned to, which are much more uh, integrated, whether we like it or not. So how many people can get access to you and now pretend to be you or me? Well, it's endless in the sense of this kind of uh, acrobatics. By the way, Nietzsche was on to what I was talking about here. I didn't mention Friedrich Nietzsche, but let me just say in passing, that Nietzsche talked about the acrobat as being the tightrope walker, as being this kind of figure that symbolizes the anti-gravity. And of course, the higher you go, the deeper or the steeper the fall. And so the hyper-erotic and the hyper-tragic, they come together, they accelerate with each other, uh, and the stakes get higher. Is so, that not Trump? Didn't you just describe yes. Trump? Okay. <laughs> What? I think so, but what? I try to. What I try to. That's a. That's a bad athlete. That what, so uh, people athlete who want to uh, take their ball and go home, uh, or as uh, as uh, Eddie Glaude Jr. said, uh, clutch my pearls victimology. 
uh, just doesn't seem to be uh, very helpful uh, in the sense of not only competing and cooperating, but in terms of um, being a sincere athlete. Um, I don't think that's a sincere figure, not to mention uh, he's metaphorically unfit. Literally, I'll let you take care of the literal. He seems to be inter interested in that. So, uh, Please. I think I have something a little unusual to say, and I thank you for your gigantic hyper words. And so, just recently, I have to confess, I have given up on intellectualism because I live here in Murfreesboro, and, um, and I have found that intellect does not necessarily serve me here, even though there's theoretically a large college university, down the yeah, road. And several is, colleges, and yeah. this is my first semester out of college, so I'm having a strange, mm. I would say, out of body experience. But actually, for the first time in my life, I am through with school. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm done. And this yeah. is very new for me, and yeah. I'm good with it. But um, my question is, must we participate in this paradigm? Is it inevitable? And I can see what you're talking about, mm -hmm. but I live here. <laughs> and, and what I see is people that just don't participate. Mm -hmm. they're, they're just not there. Mm -hmm. They're somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And as an artist, what I like to do is collide things. I like to bring disparate elements, and I like to make them have to interact. So I was yes. sitting here, and, and my endless question is, how do I get, uh, how do I get the, the most rabid Republican in the room with the um, metaphysical welfare queen? And how do they survive? <laughs> but that's too small for me. I've got to put at yes. least seven yes. of these people in one place and make them survive. Right. And, and my, my point is that, um, our ideology will not save us when we are hungry. Mm -hmm. So earlier we were talking about tornadoes, and so just imagine, as I do as a creative person, we're all here now. I mean, each and every one of you. And we are trapped in this space mm -hmm. for two weeks, and all we've got is his stuff. And, <laughs> and, and so the question hey, is- a lot of stuff. Not necessarily. <laughs> Um, you've got old pipes, mm -hmm. and if we're trapped here, then that means there's something outside mm -hmm. that's also oppressing us mm -hmm. and making us have to be in this right, space. Right. And then my ultimate question is, who are we and who do we become? Yeah. And is that who we are in essence? Yeah. And if that which we become, because we have no other options, that money will not save you. Right. Hunger is a new paradigm for some people. Mm -hmm. I, I could probably be hungry for two hours without killing you. <laughs> so, <laughs> the odds are not good. But just the fact that our personality is under pressure and and I think that this participation in, shall we say, a type of high culture mm -hmm. is maybe optional. And that we all cannot win the bat brass ring. Yeah. And so when I live in a place like this and I drive 10 miles that way, yeah. and then I'm in Amish country, right. then they have a whole other thing going on. Yeah. Well, let me say that uh, I have this discussion with my students all the time. If you, for example, say to at a job interview or something, I don't have social media. You're already under the microscope of mass conformity, which is to say you're either hiding something or you're weird or uh, there's a sense in which a subtle pressure is put on you to join these rituals uh, and you're seen as an outsider if not. Uh, that may not be totally the case, but I will say to go off of your example with the Amish, it is even difficult for them to escape it, as I think of the list of Amish reality TV shows now that's going on in my, <laughs> that's going on in my head. Because one of the because by the way, one of the things one of the things that the athletic renaissance is about is: do you want to play sports for play for serious endurance, or do you want to play sports as spectacle? And clearly, uh, uh, reality TV has taken over in the sense of spectacle. Look at the White House, right? Uh, so, so in that sense. Uh, I don't know if you can escape the Crystal Palace, to use the, uh, that metaphor, another fancy metaphor, uh, because, and here's why. Because I happen to believe that we are a species that wants to be luxurious, which is to say to improve ourselves. Now, we may disagree on about how we are going to live well and live better, but we seek in a general sense, we can agree to try to improve ourselves, to try to um, uh, enhance ourselves, intensify ourselves, better ourselves, whatever qualifier you want to use. And from that standpoint, 
you were using the example of us being in here. Well, the human being, in a certain sense, never leaves a house, which is to say a kind of comfort zone, right? Uh, and, and unlike penguins who have igloos, human beings would never be able to live there because we all need our own. I need my own room because I'm high maintenance. And I think human beings are actually like this. And I think that we have, in a certain sense, been taught or enforced or uh, pressured to not embrace this kind of diva side of ourselves, this kind of high maintenance side of ourselves. And I think you brought it out in your example. It's like, hey, two weeks, that ain't going to be enough food for me. Two hours without going without food? Shoot, I'm hungry. You better look out. That's the high maintenance that I think you put your finger on that I want to embrace. Let me say that the anthropologists of the 20th century that started writing on this kind of theory, people like John Kenneth Galbraith or Arnold Galen or uh, even um, Tawny and his Acquisitive Society, if you're familiar with that book, they all thought this was a negative thing. So they didn't see the hyper-erotic side. That's why I tried to just start out with that, to emphasize the possibilities in it, because I, I don't think you want to throw it away. I don't think you want to become a Luddite, which is someone who rejects all technology. So uh, I don't think the extremes are healthy and I don't think that it's a good um, approach for the, the life of practice, the life of training, the life of exercising in a broad sense, in this athletic sense. So, In one sentence, would you say what hyper-erotic means? <laughs> Possibilities that lure us to be daring, to be riskful, risk takers. Okay. Yeah. And of course it comes with a high cost. That's why the hyper erotic and the hyper tragic go together. So yeah. just like the erotic and the tragic go together, but the reason why I'm using hyper here is because uh, it's to emphasize the anti-gravity. So I didn't mention this, so let me say it real quick. I'm juxtaposing this with gravity and gravitas. The idea is that gravity holds us down it is mostly seen as tragic. For example, uh, to use religion as a basic template, God has always been a representative of anti-gravity. God has always been able to overcome those things that hold us down, those things such as death. Uh, so God was always a, divine theology to me has always been different versions of the anti-gravity or overcoming uh, the limitations, whether it's walking on water or changing you know, water to wine or you know, turning two fish into 500 fish. This is all impressive and it relies upon the hyper erotic. Um, so when I talk about the hyper erotic and anti-gravity, I'm talking about a kind of non-seriousness that doesn't hold us down, but it wants us to have the largest skyscraper in the world. It wants us to have the fastest car in the world. It wants us to have the vehicle that can go the furthest in the, in the uh, galaxy. And it can even have the tools to see. I just heard the other day, it shocked me. They supposedly, they're 99% sure. There's still that 1%. So we gotta, we, gotta, we gotta make sure we are very careful about this. But has anybody heard about this? Um, that they have supposedly discovered a planet in the next galaxy over from the Milky Way. If you haven't heard about it, look it up. 99% sure, but the point is, is why are they looking for that and what are they even doing? <laughs> to me, it is hyper-erotic, anti-gravity, and these kinds of projects that are about actually playing more so than being serious. So it's a kind of non-serious play, and this is what civilization wants to do. Um, but it's, they're very, I believe, deceptive and devious about it because civilization really sells us more on becoming very tragic. When I hear a lot of my students coming in, you know, a freshman class, for example, and already having a sense of what they're going to do for the rest of their life. I find this to be very tragic given the fact that the world is very fast moving. Um, the world uh, life, uh, as one of my favorite professors used to say, shit happens. Uh, and so if you want to be bald, if you want to be uh, uh, held down by a certain regimen that doesn't have a rich sense of uh, ventilation to possibilities, then it's going to be a very stuffy, closed, um, cold, if you will. By the way, anti you can turn this into a climate politics, I just saved you the time, but uh, anti-gravity is associated with heat, obviously, in warm places as opposed to cold places, right? So. The more people that are 
miraculous. That's what you're yes, I yes. Think that word yes. That you're the miraculous, the marvelous, these were all uh, uh, synonyms for anti gravity. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I'm getting. Yeah. So, um, the first encounter I really had with anti gravity was well, I read it in a book, <laughs> and I thought that was a cool idea. Uh, but then I looked at the jump man. I looked at Michael Jordan. You've seen the jump man, it's universal language now. Everybody knows what it means from China to Paris to New York to Murfreesboro, Illinois. And so the jump man for me was a bit, real big awakening for this notion of anti-gravity and levitation projects. So I see Silicon Valley as a place where they engage in these kinds of levitation projects, which are very playful. Um, when you hear about Tesla, for example, uh, you say to yourself, you know, what's the need for this, right? Clearly they're looking for the marvelous, the miraculous, the unfathomable, going beyond uh, the limits or uh, the presupposed boundaries. Uh, the boundaries are seen as fuzzy under these kinds of conditions that we can penetrate through, that we can pervade and we can uh, reformat. This age is about reformatting, whether it comes in the form of our technologies or it comes in the form of readjusting our instruments and institutions and um, agreements. Um, the stuff that I was talking about with regards to the copyright law and intellectual property rights. So uh, reformatting is a big part of the limits of resemblance. Because again, if something doesn't resemble what was, in a certain sense, it has been reset. It has been reformatted. And by the way, the reset button is a very interesting notion. <laughs> when I was a kid, hitting the reset button was very convenient when I was losing in a video game or something. And this is, if this is an anti-gravity, I don't know what it is. You get a kind of built-in purgatory right there. Uh, so, um, Start all over. yes, yes. Everybody's got the nine lives. Everybody's got the nine lives now. And that's what you're talking about for like people not being loyal. Yes. Huh? None of, we're not in an age of loyalty. We're in an age of free agents. And so the goal of uh, so-called successful people is to not have one house. I need two houses. I can't have one car. I need two cars or three cars or a truck and a car and I need a motorcycle as well. I need my regular partner and maybe a side partner. This is the reality of the future. Uh, one of my favorite rappers says, I can't have just one phone, I need two phones. <laughs> right? One isn't enough. We're the divas of nature. This is very wasteful. That's the hyper tragic side. I know it makes people feel very uncomfortable uh, because the, tra the hyper tragic side is how much waste this creates and how much spam ontology. Uh, you get everybody knows about spam. So ontology is just a kind of way of saying it's a kind of system. It has a structure. You'll keep seeing it showing up. But we all know about spam. And you're just talking about like how culture and the media has sold this bill of goods to everybody. They've sold, I would say, more of uh, tragedy and gravity rather than the anti-gravity. So what they've done yeah. is gotten us worked up, and uh, they've gotten us into a kind of. Uh, uh, emphasis on the hyper tragic whereas nothing to me could be further from the truth given the fact that we have so much privilege I mean does anybody stop to think why a caravan would be coming no they really don't they just want to fight you know how, how should you treat them should you embrace them in your immigration policy or should you turn them away I want to ask the question why are they trying to get in and what do they want what's the miracle right they see the yeah, and, can, and so if you start to think about it that way, it's very difficult to blame anybody who wants to better themselves. And I'm not just talking about in an economic sense. I'm talking about they feel like the economic sense to me turns them into something like cattle. And so I have, I'm very, uh, very non-sympathetic to those kinds of arguments because I hear a lot of conservatives making those arguments that, well, I'm for immigration and it's because they're going to take jobs that we won't do. Well, I think most of us wouldn't do those jobs if we had the choice because, again, of this divas of nature being high maintenance. The goal today is to be kind of dissatisfied like the athlete, but you're in all of this privilege and all of this satisfaction. You actually don't need to be dissatisfied. And so you don't need to take it that seriously, is what, what I'm trying to say, yeah. So the media, to go back to your response, the media and uh, uh, the talking heads, 
have done a good job of not only polarizing people, but making people very combative and not flexible, not versatile. And this means we're all bad practitioners when it comes to listening. A big part of the next project I'm working on related to this is a big part of the athletic renaissance is relearning the art of listening. Mm. Wow. I heard somebody say, making listening great again. I said, nah, nah, nah. I've heard that enough. <laughs> I've heard again enough. <laughs> so I didn't say make learn listening great again, but you can interpret my words that way if you want or something. So. <laughs> you know, words are words, but there's a feeling that goes with everything. Yeah. So there you go. Absolutely. Sometimes you can have somebody like, that's why we call him Chump. Yeah. He doesn't have any other name to me, but Chump. <laughs> because would you let that guy in your house? No. You yeah. wouldn't invite him over because he just lies. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you can feel it. Well, you let me say this. Based off of what we were just talking about, you can see how, just going off of uh, what you said about Trump, if everything is a lie or a potential lie, then Trump looks normal. And that's yeah. in that system. Yep. In the political system. Yeah. That's why. And by the way, uh, I didn't talk about this, but politics to me is very unfit. It's very toxic. And so I believe that Trump, like Obama, is really not a politician in the traditional sense. He's more of a cultural icon. And so they actually want to be more like athletes. Yeah. In this yeah. kind of full blown, in this robust sense. They're just up there in front. Sure. All righty, Myron. Thank you. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it. It's awesome. Thank you.